With a twist of my left glove, the Ordocino's Inquisitor is frozen in my labyrinth, because I have need of the Pharos, and no need for foaming at the mouth extremists ready to flay me alive for my heresies. I know I should be able to use the Tesseract to teleport myself anywhere, same as the cheating Trezin does, but I am still learning how to use it, and I suspect my dear skeletal friend didn't give me the complete instruction manual. Come, dear Fidelia. Let me introduce you to my crew, and observe the battle with the High Fleet. I say gently once the hug becomes too long and perhaps uncomfortable. We walk onto the bridge hand in hand, just to preempt any zealous bodyguard from overreacting. Pef. You found another sister. Alana exclaims and rushes to embrace the stunned Null Maiden. She'll get used to hugs soon, I suspect. Lord Pef. I thought you took a break, not gallivanting after more wives. Ludvius says with a smirk, but still holds a thumb up. I just shrug as if this was normal. Blank kids need mothers. I do my duty, just like everyone. I explain without actually saying anything of importance. This always works, even now. Then I examine the fleet situation, and the state of the battle with the Xenos. More Nova shells have been fired at concentrations of Tyranid ships, and melter torpedoes on the largest exemplars. Weapon batteries and lances keep blasting away, from our fleet and the besieged defenders of Sutha, and the Hive fleet is getting slowly reduced in numbers. Very slowly, as even inactive the bioships are quite difficult to kill. Cygnus, come to the teleportarium. We need to beam atomic warheads inside these larger bioships before they recover and eat everyone. Otherwise, great job, crew. Stay vigilant. With a plausible reason for my absence, I leave the bridge again, followed by my bodyguards. Teleportarium, you wouldn't try to run away again, Lord Peff? Ludvius wonders and pokes my pauldron. I grin mischievously. Perhaps I will hide away with the silent sister somewhere. They are famous for keeping secrets, after all. Even the Emperor had a legion of them inside his palace. And not just for their voices. I reply with a teasing hint. Fidelia stomps her foot and glares at me for my heretical words. You think the Emperor, used to bang a legion of sisters? Ravan asks, just to make sure. Well, I'm not going to answer that. I mean I will, but directing the revenge onto another target. These days, there is a branch of the Inquisition, called the Illuminati, that actively hunts a particular type of people. They are eternal, not subject to age nor the dangers of warp. Some of them are both blanks and psychers, just like their parents were. The Inquisition calls them sensei, and fears them, because they would be the rightful rulers of the Imperium, as natural heirs to the living Emperor. I can see both Ludvius and Rafan begin getting red in the eyes, which is exactly the result I wanted. Fidelia is even more amazed, and pats her neck in voiceless anger. Big secret though. So keep quiet. I murmur as the elevator doors open at the teleportarium deck. My engine seer Cygnus meets me here after a minute, and goes to his command console to begin preparing for teleporting warheads. Normally, the active silence in the warp would prevent most teleports, and only powerful psychers like librarians or inquisitors would be able to reach a hive bioship. Not so much right now, while the Tyranids are trembling in synaptic overload. No wonder the Scythes wanted to teleport on board the bioships to battle the tyrants or other Xenos creatures in melee. Dumb idiots. Rafan, stay guard and check every coordinate twice. Don't want to blow up a friendly ship or fort. I explain while I retrieve my rosette and beam onto the planet, where the locator beacon pointed. Ludvius and Fidelia get included and beam alongside me, and they can only stare at the imprisoned Catan which lay on the wall, slightly dissected. Pef lance fire. Please tell me I don't have to endure that foolish inquisitor, much longer. The Katan Zorhulash asks in an annoyed voice. I was never here, mighty Zorhulash. You never saw me, because this is an Inquisition base, and I don't have clearance to be here or know about it. However, it has come to my attention that Drukhari raids still continue, probably from Port underscore Carmen in the webway. I explain politely, and produce an incendiary torpedo right in front of me. The Katan examines me and my retinue with murderous eyes. What do you want, rogue trader? You always trade for things, and this time I have something you need. I nod politely while I link with the Inquisitor's apparatus and download his findings in my mind impulse implant. 
Obviously, the mind probing device was of Maconicus origin, since only they make anything technical for humanity. Then, I extract the sounding board from the good labyrinth and connect it to the Pharos once again. The galaxy opens in my mind's eye again, with slightly better controls and fidelity. Can you guide an exterminatus torpedo onto Port Carmen? I wonder while I locate a host of new targets in the nearby Hadex anomaly. I could, for a price. The Catan answers in a hateful voice. I sigh inward while I locate the world of Stigmatus, and consign billions of souls to oblivion. The flames engulf the low orbit as well, incinerating the orbital shipyards and a hundred chaos vessels based on this cultist world. Another incendiary torpedo moves in its place, inside the Pharos. That was Stigmatus, in case you were wondering. I hear flames are a great purifiers for sins. I explain in a low voice. Ludvius pats my head, while Fidelia simply hugs me with one hand. Good enough, I guess. Perhaps a warmer reward in my bedroom, one day. How many of these torpedoes do you have, Lord Peff? My Astartes friend wonders, as I begin to activate the new warhead. Over a hundred. Those guys in the Astral Claws sure collected plenty of the Exterminatus munitions for their rebellion. And now, they are mine to use, on whomever I deem fit, as a chapter master. I muse out loud. No more need to ask my Rose for permission. I only listen to the Emperor, after all. So better start talking, dear Adam. I listen for a few seconds to make sure, but my best buddy doesn't speak. The fortress world of Magog joins the screaming pyre, despite the warp storm surrounding it. Thousands of traitor space marines vanish in the hellish flames, as do whole hive cities infested with mutants and other chaotic cultists. A single structure remains in orbit, intact and impossibly massive. A Blackstone underscore fortress now devoid of life and most demons. I even have a buyer for this Necron artifact of old. A Necron of old. My knees start trembling from the mental effort, but I should be good for one or two more deep strikes. Lord Trezin. How goes the search for those reality cages? I ask a minute later. Oh, the mysterious stranger. That Badab war you predicted wasn't all that exciting. I expected entire sectors to burn, in interchapter conflict among Astartes. The Necron magician complains, and doesn't answer. So he didn't find them, which isn't so good. Probably too much chaos interference, but I have a cure. With some effort, I prime another exterminatus warhead, this time a dual-stage cyclonic torpedo. Store this weapon, and release on the hellforge of Gianna underscore two I whisper in his mind. As expected, the Necron Lord simply pokes the torpedo and it vanishes inside a labyrinth. I see. This is to aid me explore the Eye of Terror without so many impediments. And it was even released from those complicated safety protocols. As for our future trade, I have found an abandoned Blackstone fortress in orbit above Magog, among the Cairn stars. Paid in advance, so you may as well collect it now. I mutter while I bring out the final warhead, another incendiary. Then I just wait, until Trezin teleports and collects the fortress, as it is rather rare and valuable. I have to admit, you do find the most wondrous things somehow. Do you even know, how valuable such an ancient station is? Trezin asks me, possibly to check my knowledge. I just shrug. Not that much value for me, since I wouldn't be able to activate it. If you can close the Hadex anomaly with it, then it might be worth something. A minute passes while the insane Necron considers my words. You even know its true purpose, how amazing. So what do you need from me? Well, I can be shameless now. I want a certain Catan shard called the Crimson God, from the Necron world of Dole. Of course, I want it trapped and enslaved and ready to work, in a tesseract with complete instruction manuals. The Necron Lord hesitates. That is a crown world, stranger. Even if it belongs to another dynasty, my race would frown if my forces attacked them. Dole has already been attacked, by a huge orc war. Most of the Novak dynasty troops have been killed, and the surface burns. Should be easy enough for someone with skill and patience to sneak in and abscond with the Catan Shard. I advise the insane Necron while pushing on my enslaver bone staff. He shakes his head as if disturbed. That's a compelling argument. Both an orc attack and an exterminatus? Perhaps the Crimson King has begun to slip up. Another Catan Shard, for that fortress. Ah, 
What to do? What to do? He mutters in indecision. Esteemed overlord, have you heard about something called a side titan of the Ordo Sinistress? I add without letting him think too long. What? Tell me more. He demands in a rush. Look at the time. I have to go, for my other job. Do we have a deal, or should I contact say, a certain hollow sun? I wonder in slight pain. Damn mental connection over thousands of light years is tiring, who knew? Yes. I'll manage somehow. And do not dare to trade with those criminals from the hollow underscore sun. Trizin warns me in a categorical tone. I turn off the link, and stare at the mighty Zorhulash. You were saying something about a trade, mighty Katan? I ask in fake innocence. This being is still alive and can still feel fear. I know it, because I can see it in his eyes. Whatever Trizin does to enslave his Katan shards, it must be horrifying enough to induce such fear, into someone tortured by an inquisitor for years without anything sign of discomfort. I suspect he was only mildly annoyed. Of course not, Pef Lancefire. You are a merciful being, worthy of praise among the stars. I shall endeavor to aid your exterminatus warhead reach Port Carmen, in the webway. Purge the Dark Eldar. He proclaims valiantly. Someone has spent too much time with the Ordo Xenos. Ludvius coughs in surprise, and a soft breath enters my ear from Fidelia's side. Oh my! I think someone is in love. Well, there's time enough for love. But right now, there's vengeance to be had first. I flick the atmospheric incendiary torpedo into the webway, and monitor it as the Catan pilots it to its final destination. Much easier to do than last time, because I have grown a bit more and I have this enslaver staff to lean on. Time in the webway doesn't pass normally, or perhaps at all. It is a very strange environment as kilometer-wide tunnels twist and circle around for no reason. Well, perhaps they bend around gravity wells like stars and black holes, which makes some sense. Or perhaps it's simply an aesthetic choice from the Dari gods who built it. Hordes of alien creatures battle inside, Eldar and Drukhari among them, but hundreds of different species too. The webway seems to be a final refuge for many species thought extinct, and for many others interested in trade or warfare and plunder. Zorhulash coasts above an entire maiden world, and keeps going. Dark suns illuminate the paths inside the tunnels, halfway outside reality completely. I think I heard of such a dark sun making appearances in the Calyxis sector, driving people mad for weeks then vanishing again. Humans call it the tyrant underscore star and believe it brings some kind of prophecy. Well, I'm almost certain I know someone who collects rare items. If the Dark Eldar can play with this kind of forces, or perhaps is that Harlequin god, called Sigorak, he would be the type to torment people for no reason, just to have a laugh. Then the torpedo emerges above Port Carmen, where there are thousands of Eldar ships gathered for some big raid. I even see a few spiky capital vessels like the Falling Moon class battleship which gets hit directly. Their defensive shadow field isn't of use against a physical torpedo, and the surprise is total. The explosion ruptures something important inside the battleship, because while a burning atmosphere is rather lethal for any life form, including durable ones like Tyranids and Dark Eldar, that antimatter fuel is even worse. Zorhulash's mind stays to observe the genocide, for a few seconds, before snapping back into the coffin of living rock chains that bind his flesh to suit her. And that was Port Carmen. I counted two billion deaths for this strike, Pef Lancefire. Even a couple of their archons. They appeared to prepare for a punishment raid, you were quite fortunate to intercept that large fleet at anchor. The Catan explains proudly. What do you mean? Mighty Zorhulash. The Drukhari had gathered right now to be exterminated by my punishment raid? Don't be preposterous. I decline in a dismissive voice. The Catan blinks in confusion, then looks away in defeat. That's right, you evil godling. You met my luck perk now, how do you like that? My legs wobble a little from the effort, so no more exterminatus for some time. Maybe tomorrow. I send my escorts away back on the Serenity, and return to my rogue trader persona. Lord Trizin. Any luck with my item? I ask in a pleasant voice. It was much easier than it seemed, stranger in my head. Luckily, the Crimson King was suffering from an immense headache, almost like someone had tried to snap the control binder over this Catan shard with brute force. 
The Crimson King even passed the control scarab to an underling, so he could rest. I only had to ask for the shard box back, and the idiot lich gave it to me. The overlord proclaimed in self-praise. Well, a silly rogue trader had something to do with that too, I suspect. Who else tried the brute force approach and failed miserably? Trizin the Infinite holds the third tesseract in his hand, beside a strange chip or circuit, definitely of Maconicus origin. Now, the story of that side titan is sad indeed. Even worse, only someone with access to deep time investigation could recover it, and that with great care. Want to learn more? I would need to be well and not detonate under subversion. I asked teasingly. The Necron Lord suspects a trap, so he hesitates. I know he trapped that Catan somehow, because it is his nature. Or perhaps a mind virus inside the memory device. Maybe both? How did you know? Trizin asks after a minute of silence. My abilities are different, but they lead to the same future, Lord Trizin. We either work together, or we both die. And if we die, well, that would be rather bad. You should disable the traps, and prepare a minor gift for me. Perhaps that Chronoblade and the Custodes. Afterwards, I will give you an interesting problem to solve, if you are able. It might lead to another Catan. I offer as an equitable trade. Tell me of this problem first, while I work to remake the labyrinth and the console. My murderous friend accepts in a pitiful tone. Imagine someone had 10,000 Astartes in a labyrinth, but he's not an Ekron Lord so no mind scarabs. He does have enslaver bones, which should allow mind controlling even an Astartes, if carefully crafted empathic overrides are inserted into their brains. Or perhaps an Ort boss, leading a big war of billions. Even Tyranid bioships. I propose in a cheerful voice. I do have all that, and more. You have been busy, stranger. Well, finding test subjects will not be difficult at all. But different Astartes chapters have different physiology, just like Tyranid swarms differ from hive to hive. I know, because even my advanced scarabs need adjustment. Trezin explains in a thoughtful voice. Also, there are some artifacts called Halo underscore devices. Very hard to find, and completely forbidden in the Imperium. Forge World Stragos experimented with them, and found they grant eternal life and restoration of the body. Perhaps an intact device can be found on Sinophia Magna, and then reverse engineered, for Necrons and humans too. However, exposure over a few hours is, unhealthy. I had to reduce his obvious enthusiasm. Most intriguing. I'd assume the origin is the Halo Stars that you researched a few years ago? The Necron asks in a knowing voice. Well, it seems he has eidetic memory, which I also have due to my implants. I am a well of knowledge, aren't I? So, my Crimson God? I demand pleasantly. The Pharos doesn't reach on the other side of the galaxy, but why expose my weakness? With a pained sigh, Trizin the Infinite places the crystal and the memory node on his green coffin which serves as a work desk. A tiny swirl of space from the Pharos and the artifacts appear in my blackstone lined glove. Unlimited power, achieved. A quick glance at the Necron tomb of Trezak finds it deeply embroiled in a desperate battle. Tyranid organisms have already landed on the surface and began devouring anything moving. Must have been hungry, the poor creatures. In the system, there are a dozen Necron battleships and a hundred smaller vessels firing continuously at an unending stream of bioships and smaller flyers. They are still holding, but this last tendril from Hive Fleet Kraken is absorbing other smaller fleets like a river receives tributaries. Soon enough, it will be over. I strain myself and flick an overmine among the Necron escorts to hasten their demise. Perhaps two dozen of the Necron frigates are caught in the blast area and the Tyranids exploit the weakness grabbing the crippled ships and eating them with gigantic mandibles. I am too tired to send more right now, plus I only have one Novamine left. But there's no rush, I have all the time in the world. Checking on Trezin again, I find him holding the Dawn Blade in front of him, in a curious stance. Almost like he tried to divine a purpose for this weapon. Then he lets it go, and the chronophagic blade disappears in midair, and lands in my right hand. Another relic obtained. Sooner or later I will fight someone in melee, and extra years will be useful. Plus there are always traitors and cultists or even orcs. I have a billion orcs in my left glove, and a life-draining sword in my right. The future is dark, but I will probably see it now.
I point at the imprisoned Catan. This crimson god, was he a friend of yours? Never. We battled for eons, beyond the stars. We shouldn't have come to this horrible place. He says in a sad voice. I know buddy. This is a grim dark future, and there is only war. Keep silent about me. If the Inquisitor asks, say it must be some kind of automatic defense, interacting with the tyrannid silence. Chronal turbulence or something. I add as I step on the teleporter. The sounding board folds back in the good Tessa act, and so does my bone staff. I'll need to ask the Forge Master to craft me another slot for the next crystal. Soon, I will have an infinity gauntlet holding my tesseracts, like in those comics. I can only hope it will be enough. The hunt for the Hive Fleet continues as I return to the teleportarium, with Engine Sea Cygnus and my Blood Angel Raffin directing plasma warheads inside cruiser-sized bioship. It seems we have run out of atomic warheads, but the Hive Fleet has also ran out of battleship-sized organisms. At least live ones. My destroyers keep shoving dead carcasses on descending orbits towards the Suta's sun, while my barge and cruisers blast away at smaller tyranids, who are still insensate from their synaptic links getting brutally broken. However, the Scythes and the Death Watch ships simply stay in a defensive posture around the Aegida fortress, their range too far to help anymore. This is annoying. Why should my ships do all the work? I hope you're enjoying the show, Astartes. Now that Peflant's fire is here, the battle is won and there's no need to fire your weapons anymore. I send on their Vox channel. I think Ludvius snorts in amusement. Maybe it was Canus. We have orders, Chapter Master Lancefire. A voice I know answers in a sad tone. Captain Thrasius. It's all right then. If the Emperor himself spoke to you, there's nothing to worry about. Pef out. I answer and close the Vox box. Damn idiots. Chaplain Delos points his finger at me in warning. That's very close to the line, Captain. You don't know who gave them orders to hold station around the fortress. So you think it wasn't the Emperor? Pretty sure that's the exact letter of the Codex. You're very close to the line, Astartes. I mutter in dismay and leave the bridge, with my bodyguards and a few silent sisters escorting me to my rooms. Ludvius seems to want to argue but I signal him not to. There is a greater play involved, and it might end with disappearing inquisitors. A minute later I rest in my cogitator chair, the second one made of adamantium bars. Not going to remove my armor with tyranids around. Then I extract my new toy and begin exploring the enhanced options available to tesseracts, including complex manipulations of the inner dimensions, or speeding up passage of time at different locations, gravity controls and many more. It is basically a sandbox universe, the size of a solar system. This gives me some ideas, for later. Technically, I could grow people in a hyperbolic chamber. Or plants and animals, or all of them. Trizin may be smart, but he isn't quite sane. Probably never considered doing life quality experiments, only his crazy quest for relics and rare people. The Catan godling I leave as he is, impaled by a hundred living rock chains and looking rather sad and desperate gonna need to master all those special controls before I mess with a god, even a broken one. Instead, I focus on the silent sisters, examining each of them in detail. With my mind. Except a few of them, most are older and seem rather experienced, maybe even veterans. Sadly, they are not superhuman like the Astartes. Their flesh will decay and fail them, and the process has already begun. Damn cretins in the Astra Telepathica. Life extension treatments would enhance their knowledge and combat ability for every century they gain, just like nobles and admirals receive. But human life is worth little in the Imperium, and these sisters have no rights, not even to speak. I shall make sure they are all rescued and brought to my own kingdom. Somehow. I don't even know how to begin collecting their hidden communities, or those sisters kept as guards on the black ships or inside inquisitorial fortresses. Everyone out but the sisters. I demand out loud, including Ludvius and my wolf. Canis eyes me with surprise, before giving out a pitiful cry and shuffling after the blood angel. Then Ludvius closes the Blackstone armor door, and not even Psychers can listen in anymore. I snap my fingers, and the room fills with nineteen more silent sisters. Feels great to copy the classics. And those movies are forty thousand year old here.
pretty sure only Adam or some other Eternal remember them. Instead, the Frozen sisters who seem ready to attack someone, and I'm the only valid target. Wait. We're safe here. Alana yells and starts explaining her adventures. Fidelia stays by her side and keeps gesturing with additional information about me, or my plans. Feels kinda crazy to hear Alana's story from her perspective. My deeds and accomplishments are right there with the saints and other famous people. But I don't interrupt and let her speak, because her sisters cannot. It would be fine if they were simply willing themselves to be silent, but those vows were enforced with mimetic constraints, possibly similar to how the rosette worked, and quite certainly with the same origin. When Malkador the Sigilite started his inquisition, he wasn't given that title for collecting emblems and postcards. The old monster was a master of mimetic and psychological indoctrination, and the results of his work last to this day, in the Grey Knights and other groups started by him. The Emperor was much better than Malkador, and he had silent sisters even then, housed inside his imperial palace in the Himalayas. I brought my staff out and began asking for names. It was slow and a bit painful, but we managed to connect I think. The Null women weren't so scared anymore. Ludvius, prepare habitation for twenty women. Adjacent rooms if possible. I asked in my mind, curious if the staff could pierce the blackstone armor. The blood angel opened the door and did a quick count. Five rooms, four beds each? He asked in a wry voice. Yes Ludvius. Wake me up in ten hours. I muttered as I fell asleep, still in my power armor. Wasn't very comfortable, but I should get used to living in my armor. All Astartes did, when deployed. And some of them were deployed for centuries. Much later, I woke up to the smell of blessed CF. I didn't drink much of that poison anymore, but I still loved the smell. We're almost at 10% with the Tyranid fleet, Captain. Over 950 kills and climbing. Ludvius explained after sipping from my coffee for some reason. Someone else was in the room too. I turned and saw a couple of Lamenta apothecaries beside the door, waiting for orders. We have called reinforcements, Master Lancefire. The Tranquility and the Icarus will arrive in three days. One of them explained in a patient tone. Made sense in my half-working battleship plus a thousand corvettes will speed up the cleaning duty, hopefully before the Xeno swarm recovered. I nodded and grabbed my cup before the ugly blood angel drank it all. Medical testing for the new sisters. Oldest first, get them into prime time as soon as possible. Blank recruits will need lots of hard work. I ordered after gulping half of my cup. Didn't taste so great anymore. One of the apothecaries tried to say something, but the first one just pushed him out. Hopefully nothing bad. What else? I asked Ludvias in a curious tone. The Inquisitor has disappeared. Or anyway, the Death Watch cannot contact him. It seems he was supposed to be underground in the secret facility that nobody is allowed to know about. He says in a small grin. I smile widely. I still need the Pharos for myself. Plenty more torpedoes in my pocket. I knew it. The same trick as you used with the sisters? Also, the Eldar prisoners have vanished somewhere too. My brothers are very worried, and punches were mentioned by an irate captain. He added with a snort. I just shrugged and finished my CF serenely. The Emperor works in mysterious ways. And an Astartes listens only to the Emperor. Maybe a Primarch, if he's not a traitor. Kinda even odds there. Ludvius grunted as if in pain. Inquisitors speak in the name of the Emperor, Captain. You must take care. I nodded gravely. I am taking all precautions, and gather evidence before I execute them. Of course, sometimes they never find a body. Much cleaner that way. Ludvius blinked with his single good eye, and then sighed. Please stop talking, Captain. Just find a way, somehow. You're right, brother. Let's go eat, and then blow up some Xenos, I exclaimed cheerfully and pushed myself up. Nothing invigorated me more than the promise of burning demons in the morning. Soon enough, we teleported inside the Pharos for another extermination round, this time the demon worlds of Bulwark, then Dorel and lastly Coronin. All three worlds were rather close, still in the Hadex anomaly. I could have potentially burned one more, but didn't want to tire myself to exhaustion again. I decided to test the Dawn Underscore Blade, the new relic I have received from Trizin, so I did. 
a dozen orcs as a test, and then an Eldar. Didn't work quite as I expected, but that might be because of my blank nature, so I had to ask Ludvias to try it too. He decapitated a dozen confused orcs and another Eldar, and waved the strange weapon around. Why are we doing this, brother? He asked as I policed the crime scene and vanished the bodies near the sun. I heard a rumor about this type of weapon. But I suppose we do have sanguineous blood and extended lifespan. Let me bring Letitia and Fidelia here. I mused to myself while kidnapping those sisters from their room. An armored hand arrived in front of my face, so possibly Fidelia wasn't too happy. Peace, my dear Null Maidens. Take this weapon, and strike at neck level. I explained and summoned an orc shooter, without his weapon. While the stupid mushroom checked his empty hands in confusion, Fidelia struck with excellent strength and control, parting the muscled neck like, a green vegetable, perhaps. Almost instantly, an invisible wave passed through the blade into her. Not warp-based, because she was a pariah, completely immune to that type of emissions. But, something life-related, or maybe fate? Chronal manipulation was also possible for Necrons or Huds as well, and those were not psychers. Oh? Another strange ability of yours? Ludvius asked with obvious interest. It is merely a chronophagic blade, nothing special. Zorhulash spoke from his impaled shape on the cavern's wall. Eternal life was pretty special, to me. I shook my head and began summoning more and more orcs, while observing Fidelia for changes. About thirty orcs later, those stolen years began coursing back through the sword and into my new girlfriend. Fidelia looked vibrant and healthy now, skin clean and rosy and she seemed to have lost thirty years, although her eyes were still wise and stern like all the veterans. Pass the sword to Letitia. I guess we won't need expensive rejuvenation anymore. I do have a billion orcs stored in my pocket. I explained while drawing the pretty red-headed maiden into a hug. She kissed my cheek in thanks, so I must be doing something worthy of praise, just like the imprisoned Catan claimed. While the decapitation program continues with all the silent sisters with ease, I consider Zorhulash's words. Just one chronophagic blade is not enough, not even to maintain my growing clan healthy and young. I need a few for my sons as before they undergo gene implantation, I need a few for my daughters, for my officers, even for the loyal tech priests or my concubines or, yep. I'd need at least a dozen. So I have to go to the source. Or send someone, trustworthy. Few of them around. Ludvius, my brother. You and Rafan have a small mission. Undercover insertion on Arthas underscore Moloch, and recovery of ancient artifacts of similar nature with this dawn blade. With those words, I brought down Rafan and a land underscore speeder scouting vehicle, held in the air by anti-grav fields. My dear Hestia asked to join them and it made sense. As a pariah, she would be useful if they stumbled onto demons. Use your vox box during this mission, Hestia. And take these weapons, a power sword and inferno pistol. You're looking for old temples or other similar structures, with statues. Statues that hold weapons. I explained and kissed her for good luck. They all had blackstone armor plates, power weapons and force fields, so there wouldn't be any immediate risk. Plus, I would be on standby for rapid recovery. In a minute, I deposited their speeder on that artifact planet, next to the largest structure still standing. And then they sped up, since those anti-grav recon crafts could move. The planet was mostly desert, land broken and cracked and devoid of any life. Something has completely scoured the former inhabitants, possibly for good reasons. I did such extermination events myself, on evil places. An hour later, their speed stumbled onto a recon party of the Tau, also exploring the ruins with advanced scanners and a dozen battlesuits for protection. Well, I did lack Tau figurines in my collection. By miracle, their weapons began disappearing from their suits' arms, and so did that nice scanner. So when a pair of Astartes and a power-armored sister jumped on them, they were kinda surprised and defenseless. Prisoners. My Ordocino's Inquisitor might want to ask questions, I whispered in their minds. I'm certain your rose will be ecstatic for some Tau, Captain. Rafn answered in my mind, while holding the Tau at gunpoint. One by one, when in contact with my Astartes I could yank the prisoners from light years away and then store them in a labyrinth. 
Probably this was how Trezin worked, sending his puppets and doppelgangers to explore and retrieve artifacts or people, instead of risking his immortal necrodermis. It was mentally tiring, but indeed posed little risk for myself. Are those Tau? They are so blue. Alana asked leaning on me from the side. Yes my dear. And they are all nearly blank. Very smart too. I explained in an amused voice. Still, it didn't bode well. A recon party on the surface, meant a Tau ship in orbit. They would come looking for their guys soon. I began searching the orbit, and indeed found a Tau Galith underscore class underscore battleship with a hundred of space fighters, engaging a scythe strike cruiser and beating them back. Well then. I had a last Nova mine, and it would work wonders, with some timing. The Miu began computing the best deployment spot, and then, boom. A gigantic flare obliterated all the tiny fighters and dropped the battleship's shields. The Tau didn't stay and argue anymore, turning their explorer battleship around to escape. A plasma warhead on their bridge cancelled the maneuver, leaving the ship drifting off into the void. Soon enough, the side's cruiser turned around and pounced, sending assault boats and boarding torpedoes to secure the engines and conquer the crippled ship. Another good deed, that nobody will know how it happened. Such was my fate, to work from the shadows and strike at humanity's enemies. But it seemed that the Tau didn't learn the lesson, if they were still contesting imperial borders. I turned my eyes on their capital and bombed their shipyards again, flinging smaller plasma warheads and catching a dozen cruisers at anchor as well. Focus on defense guys. Really. Expansion wasn't wise. I did a quick scan over my holdings in the eastern fringe, and located a nearby orc planet battling a small Tyranid fleet. This was worrisome. In a few years they will reach my secluded kingdom, and we were not ready. We have located a polearm of similar make, Captain. Also, big flashes in orbit, that was you, right? Ludvius asked in my mind. Right. The artifact quest. Shouldn't let my mind drift. I returned my focus on my away team. That was just a Tau battleship. Our brothers from the sides of the Emperor are boarding the derelict right now. I explained in a wry voice. Just a battleship, huh? Well, we're continuing the search. The veteran space marine said in a snort. What can I say? I'm just that good. Aldari cruiser exiting the webway in 30 solar seconds. Zorhula spoke from his perch, while observing me with curious eyes. Only a cruiser? I complained out loud. I had hundreds of Eldar cruisers. Still, they probably wanted their people back. Maybe even the intact ships, what to do? They have an avatar on board. Stronger than me, in my current state. The Katan warned me after the Eldar ship emerged from the portal and casually plowed through the improvised minefield. Do you want an Eldar avatar? Lord Drizin. I asked in a teasing voice, changing my focus again to my best trading partner. Yes. Kane, I expect. But good enough. Where or when? The Necron Overlord demanded in a rush. I placed him on hold, and changed focus on the Eldar cruiser. It was possible I couldn't capture this avatar, as I was rather at my limit. But he was a psyker, and psychers were weak to pariahs. Purpose of your visit, avatar? I asked in his mind. Rage. Destruction. Revenge. Your actions hurt the Dari, human. Craft worlds and many ships lost to your folly. The being replied in my mind, nearly shaking my consciousness away. Damn powerful indeed, this resurrected Eldar god. Measured response, for every attack on humanity. You will run out of craft worlds, sooner than I run out of torpedoes. You are now warned. I answered in a categorical voice. The Eldar cruiser stopped and began unleashing powerful lances on the dormant hive ships. Stronger than a battleship, and without needing to recharge or cool down. Just beam after beam of concentrated death. We shall aid in cleansing the great devourer. You will return the captured Eldari to us. We are not numberless like you, humans. Every one of us is precious beyond belief. The being boomed painfully in my mind so I had to shield myself with the Enslaver staff. I meditated on that for a few seconds. Local alliances of convenience with the Eldar were always broken later. It was in their nature, and in ours too. But perhaps something valuable could be obtained. I clenched my fist, and began vanishing the remaining Tyranid bioships in my labyrinth.
much faster than even an avatar could kill them. This will suck later, but right now I needed to project strength. Calling Trizin here would invite a host of problems that I didn't want to deal with. Your aid, is not as valuable as you presume it is, Avatar. I was simply training my troops in a controlled scenario. I explained while setting aside ten Eldar cruisers in bad shape but still able to fly, then filled them back with crew, and double crew at that. Then I released those ten cruisers beside the Avatar's ship. Space manipulation? No wonder you are so arrogant, Astartes. And that Katan near you clearly helps. They are abominations that need to be destroyed. The Avatar demanded, this time at a more manageable volume, his empathic transmission buffered by my full strength minshield. I see. You propose we execute captured prisoners then? I quipped amused, and simply confiscated the released Eldar cruisers, again. That put a stop on his demands. Perhaps there could be a Geneva Convention after all. Maybe not for Tyranids, as they didn't have written language so treaties on paper were only biomass to them. Oh? You really are merciful, Pef Lancefire. Protecting me from this vengeful Dari avatar? The Katan asked in a surprised voice. The Eldar are very advanced, maybe on par with the Necrons. They are slightly deranged, but nothing compared to the Necron insanity, something caused exactly by the Katan, I believe. Humanity has numbers, but no advanced science. And then, there is the chaos and orcs and tyranids, all waiting to devour and plunder. Am I right? I asked in a soft tone, patting Elena's back for comfort. This galaxy is insane, no doubt about it. We should all run away, somewhere, anywhere else. Zorhulash pleads in a desperate tone. He is correct of course. This is even on the table, with warpless drives and tesseracts to store people during travel. A single tesseract could probably contain all humanity, frozen in stasis. Not my favorite option, but it would be better than exterminating thousands of populated worlds to create a firebreak for the Tyranids. I should probably work on that, and save a few trillions of souls from oblivion. That insane Inquisitor Cryptman was going to execute his galactic cordon, obliterating human worlds with virus bombs to deny the Tyranids replenishment biomass and stale their advance. Lack of transport ships and interest prevented the evacuation of those worlds, and thus countless lives were being wasted, not to mention habitable planets. Possibly the desire to keep things secret, as was the way of the Inquisition. No witnesses, no evidence, just dead worlds. What is your proposal, Astartes? The Avatar asked in a more reasonable voice. Just avoid attacking human ships and planets. And no more diverting enemies towards humanity. You know well enough what a dozen vortex torpedoes would unleash on a craft world. It wouldn't be humans killing your people, just Eldar nightmares entering the Materium. I offered in a pleasant tone. Of course, they will take my offer and soon forget about the pact. And then I'll have to insist. More bloodshed and lost souls, because reason was long forgotten. Disgusting threat, holding the craft worlds hostage. Will humanity respect the same for the Eldar? All over the galaxy there are aids from Astartes and other Imperium's forces. Even on defenseless Exodite worlds. The Avatar asked greedily. I do not have control over humanity, Avatar. Plus we do not distinguish Aldari from Drukari, or the Corsairs and the Exodites. Long ears attack us, we fight back. Are you taking responsibility for your dark brethren? I asked in the same tone. It is not in my powers to control those insane and reckless beings. They are disconnected from the circuits. The Eldar Godling claimed in a sad tone. Yes, I did notice that, Avatar. Here is my offer. This nice fleet I keep in my pocket, plus my other surprises. We will all travel together into the webway to Kamora, and lay them to rest. I knew these Tyranid bioships will be useful for something, I said in a cheerful voice, and released the ten cruisers again. The answer took a long time to arrive, enough to collect a thousand more Tyranid ships. This tendril was getting rather thin, getting burned and incinerated constantly by the potent Avatar, but I did have an Aqua ready to release as well. Just in case. It is a dark day, that we ally with humans to obliterate our own brethren. The Avatar announced in a somber voice. Don't be so sad, my friend. Maybe they will all repent and join you. I can be quite convincing, right? I asked as I changed focus back on the away team. 
Ah, uh, then did find a colonnade filled with armed statues. But there were thousands of demons as well. Oh well. I did have 30 more silent sisters and 60 more blood angels to send as backup. They were getting bored at my side in groups of three. One sister support two Astartes. I command them as reinforcements begin teleporting in. This seems to work nicely, except for Chaplain Delos who cannot use his powers anymore. Thousands of demons there may be, but my forces are the equivalent of several normal Astartes companies now. They have the best weapons, armor and shields I could find or steal, plus immunity from warp spells or curses. In less than an hour, the temple is secured and my dear Hestia closes that warp portal simply by punching it. Well, Captain. It appears your oak trader instincts were right on the spot. We have recovered 14 more special blades, and there are stairs leading into catacombs. Permission to explore? Ralph asks in a cheerful voice, and twirls his new polearm to find the right balance. I consider it for a few seconds, balancing risk versus benefit. Nah, better sell the location to a forged world, and let them expend a million of Skatari battling whatever monstrosities were waiting below. Perhaps one of those Ultima Sector Forges I haven't contacted yet. Going to have to befriend them too, and soon. Place a teleport beacon plus a demon warning asking for a portable Geller field, and return to your posts. You had enough fun for a single day. I order them, as I begin to grab each triplet and deposit them on the Serenity. Only Elena is not very happy, because she wasn't allowed to go. Still a novice, and no need to risk her. In a decade or two she will gain the expertise in weapons and handling armor in combat. Just like I was, training an hour or two every day with the master level warriors of the Blood Angels. You will have your fun tonight, in bed. I promise her instead, and that seems to work as well. Of course I will, Lord Peff. You better show me those other bed tricks, not just boring baby making. Elena demands in a petulant voice. Someone has been chatting with my cute nurses. Helena and Catherine, I see. I don't really mind, she does make the most enticing noises after all. By the time my other ships arrive, three days later, I have stored 3,000 Tyranid ships in my labyrinth and convinced Fidelia and Letitia to join me in bed. It is rather fast, but the sooner we start pumping babies together, the better. The galaxy depends on us. A dozen planets get to meet my fiery retribution as well including the orc capital of Sheradin, led by a self-titled arch arsonist orc boss. He didn't quite enjoy being burned alive, but such is fate. One day you burn some people, the next day you get burned in turn. A few more Necron dynasties that were awakening just now, on planets like Perdita and Trichon got to be sent deep underground by the burning atmosphere, and the rest of my exterminatus torpedoes fall on infested tyrannid worlds crawling with trillions of bugs, not only denying them fresh biomass but actually preventing the tyranids from reproducing behind the lines, was important too. My efforts during this visit possibly counted more than a dozen navy battle fleets fighting for decades. The same efforts were getting noticed by the higher beings of this universe, as proved by an immortal avatar of Cain on my doorstep. Now, for the Dark Eldar the same method wouldn't quite work, since Kamora was dispersed over many dimensions and sub-dimensions for each Drukhari Cabal, and their center of power, called High Underscore Kamora, was too well protected against deep strikes. It would take a frontal assault to pass through those wards and dimensional barriers, and I wasn't even certain the forces I brought with me would be sufficient. Anyway, it was much more than humanity alone could provide as an assault force, being so dispersed and constantly under attack from a thousand enemies from outside and within. All I could do was send deployment orders to my daughters and provide them with more STC data slates for barter, plus instructions where to mine Blackstone and what kind of ships would be of most use. Fleet carriers and system corvettes, and missile destroyers, as well as Nova Cannon armed cruisers. Battleships and battle cruisers, as well as battle barges were awesome, but took so long to build that humanity might be extinct before they finished. However, Forge Triplex Fowl did manage to complete one Victory class battleship much earlier, by a century, and the next was only decades away, due to enormous adamantium transports donated by my clan. They were also refitting the four battle barges that simply manifested in their asteroid field, of which the first one was slated for the scythes of the Emperor, and was due in a year or two. 
Forge Riser was also working on returning to service that orc ironclad battleship I gifted them, plus restoring three grand cruisers. My best buddies, Forge Antax already produced an Arc Maconicus cruiser and were working on the next, and Forge Hypnot received a nearly intact one from an unknown donor. Forge Angstrom had enough damaged hulls to restore for a century, and most forges in the Segmentum had received a ship or two from that space hull confiscated by Trizin. Compared to the other sectors, Ultima did great right now, and I planned to enforce that well-being by whatever means I had. The Inquisitor was returned to his underground cave in the Pharos when my fleet was ready to depart, and I didn't accept Vox transmissions from the Egida while my own fleet entered the webway. I save your skins, and you simply stay back and watch me burn the Tyranids without lifting a hand to help. Ungrateful bastards. And thus, I released 300 Eldar cruisers inside the webway, and waited for their avatar to coerce these Corsairs and Craft World Elders to join the pacifying expedition into Kamora. Of course, some of them were too far gone of the path of the outcast, and those crews were replaced with new ones. What will happen to those outcast Corsairs, Astartes? The Avatar asked with a mental touch. Worried? Most likely. Well, I will not place them into pits to fight Tyranids for my pleasure, like your sick brothers do. Maybe, when Ned gets born he might wish to trade me something for them. I answered in a level tone. That seemed to shock the Avatar to his core, leaving his speechless. I was used to silent companions though, so I didn't mind. Your courage knows no limit? The godling wondered in surprise. Astartes have no fear, because we are what they fear. I answer in a jovial tone. The Avatar isn't too pleased, I know. Then again, he can't be certain of my powers, and can't read me or my future. He only knows I can seemingly and effortlessly bombard his people from thousands of years away, or capture entire fleets with a snap of my fingers. Not that I need to, it's just a cultural thing we humans have. Our combined fleet gets underway, with the Avatar in the lead. Our trajectory is once again different, avoiding those turbulent conflicts or hidden maiden worlds in the webway, and thus it takes a whole day to arrive at more distant quarter of Kamora called the Old Underscore City. It seems there are many slaves here that the Avatar wants to be recovered by my cheater ability. I kinda agree as I discover tens of millions of humans and millions of Eld are kept in captivity and forced to work in gruesome factories, places filled with anguished spirits and tortured souls. With an audible growl, I begin collecting the poor slaves, wherever possible. Some are entered into torture coffins after their skin has been peeled off, others have been maimed or deformed beyond anyone's ability to heal or restore their sanity. Of course, millions of advanced weapons and other artifacts get lost and vanish, while the Eldar cruisers and starfighters battle the meager defenses. I did come to loot and plunder, and beside Dark Eldar stuff there are countless Maconicus or Eldar items, even Necron and Tau machines. In less than an hour we complete the easy task and push forward, while I stay behind the main fleet to gift an Exterminatus torpedo onto this fear factory dimension. Denial of assets and the Emperor's mercy, in a single packet. Pays to be efficient, as these weapons are quite rare indeed. Of course, I don't look back at the explosion when the Serenity crosses into the next portal. That's how people get turned to pillars of salt, after all. From here, we follow the Avatar into a kilometers wide portal that leads into low underscore Kamora, where the poor and destitute Dark Eldar live. They are all murderous criminals and cutthroats, scavengers and mutated beasts of homunculi experiments. Nothing much to salvage except a million slaves in poor condition and we move onward, while our lance and plasma batteries set fires to everything in sight. For thousands of kilometers, the ragged plastic and wood buildings and inhabitants burn, and we don't even need exterminatus here. A firestorm forms in our wake, and nothing will survive once the oxygen all burns. That's a peril if you live in a cave, no matter how large. We enter another port city called Black Blood, which has now become the main center for raiding and slave trading possibly due to losing a few ports to an accidental explosion. This takes all my concentration, capturing thousands of ships, some of which bear Dark Maconicus and other Chaos markings. Most of them are Dark Eldar though, decorated with thorns and spikes and filled with torture chambers of insane designs. Their weapons are amazingly potent, as are the engines and the navigation controls. It will take a big trade with Trezin to obtain manuals for some of this, if it's even possible. 
The McConaughey's forges would gleefully dissect everything, including Dukari or Mandrake's prisoners, for any usable data, and I will generously grant them this gift. It's only fair we return the favor, right? I collect as much as can while the Icarus deploys the corvettes and fighters for our defense, and the Eldar fleet blasts everything into light. A couple of Hemunculi underscore covens arrive from some other dimension, and begin releasing night and even titan scale monstrosities like the Talos underscore pain underscore engine, but those things are armed with few effective weapons. Scalpels, flails and venom are not the way to go against a battle fleet, as they soon discover. I only vanish a few of them for trades, and allow the fleet to exterminate the abominations with furious judgment. Volcano lances and plasma cannons, missiles and las cannons strike in huge volleys, and even a torpedo or two at the largest targets. More and more cabals and covens arrive so I decide to block a few webways with a dozen Tyranids bioships. Scalpels versus moors that can eat starships? Enjoy the pain then. A few hours later, the Dark Eldar begin to retreat and we continue behind the Avatar's fleet, with another exterminatus incinerating Port Blackblood and all its horrors. Enjoy my present.